some of the things that we've talked about when you had 200 needles put in you they weren't just random they were put in tight spots in muscles that would release the muscles which would release other muscles down the chain which would take care of the problems by increasing circulation reducing muscular tension and getting everything to move again like it should uh, so everything works for a reason. The skill of the acupuncturist is to find those places, not just because the book says put it here, but I put my hand on there and I go, there's a bump there. Bam, we need to put a needle in there, that kind of thing. Um, and going back to how the body and the brain respond to certain things, uh, what you're talking about is when you were talking about people who are missing limbs, for example, I treat people all the time with acupuncture for something called phantom pain. That is where they may have lost an arm or a leg in an accident. If it happened, if they were born without the arm or leg, it doesn't work because their brain doesn't have a representation of that area of the body to refer to. But what happens with people who lose a limb or lose some digits in some kind of an accident, for example, they'll have them cut off and then they'll say, hey man, this itches or I feel pain here. And they go, where? And they'll say, right here. And they'll, they'll be, at first they'll be bashful about it. They won't want to tell you because they'll think you think, that, that they're, you know, they got some of the screw loose, right? But they'll go, oh, it's, it's right there in that hand, right? That they don't have anymore. And you go, okay. And you treat the other side and this pain will go away. Another thing, and, and if you don't have a practitioner to do that, let's say a person like that has a common itch that's right in there. There's a brilliant doctor at uh, C, uh, California, um, UC, uh, Calif UCSD, uh, University of California, San Diego, La Jolla, named Ramachandran. And you can find videos of him on YouTube. And uh, what this guy came up with that is brilliant is it's called a mirror box. So in other words, for years and years, the best scientists in the world are trying to figure out how to handle this problem of phantom pain, how to take care of this issue, right? They're building all this machinery, they're spending all this hours, countless hours, countless dollars. So what this Ramachandran did was the guy comes in and he doesn't have this arm, right? And he says, I got an itch right here. And Ramachandran says, okay, put your arm here. And he puts it there and he puts a box with a mirror on it that cost him about $3 right here. And he says, now look at your hand on this side and your arm represented in that mirror. And you look over and you see a mirror image of this arm in that mirror as a reflection. So he goes, wiggle your hands, wiggles his hands. Hey, did the itch go away? Yeah, it went away because he's looking as if he's got the arm here. He's got a cortical representation in his brain of having that arm before, which is why he gets those feelings once in a while because the brain says there's still something there. He goes like this. That makes that itch go away because he looks at it, his brain is tricked into thinking, okay, I just took care of the problem. It makes perfect sense and it's easy to find this stuff. It's out there. The guy's written books too, but you can go to YouTube right now and find books of him lecturing and UCSD and doing TED Talks. And it's not hocus pocus and it works. And it, it, it relates back to all these things we talked about, about having that memory in your mind, recovering from a stroke, 
you talked, Greg, about one side strengthening and the other one responding. All of this is based on that principle. So if one understands this, one can make an exercise or a fitness or a recovery program based on that information for any limitation at all. And it's really very profound stuff. You know, that is very interesting because uh, my, one of the things I was thinking is that, you know, a lot of people are eggheads. Yeah. <laughs> they just don't have a frame of mind of thinking about what you and Greg are talking about. You know, they just don't think about it because of their, of what their social situation is or political, you know, they, they, they don't think about that. Uh, everything we need is in our body. We already have everything we need. All we got to do is be able to think about it. Yeah. Or observe what it is and, and the look of things. You know, you can always take somebody's advice, but you don't have to keep it. You know, but the thing is, like, when I see people that are surviving and functioning without limbs and not with the ability, like Greg was showing there, so I've done some of the, the reason I, I, I have trouble doing that now, by the way, uh, because I don't do it as thoroughly as you do, you know, as you did it, but I had a lot of that in, uh, in, 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 in you know, in my rehab. Um, a lot of people are just eggheads. They just don't think about it. They just refuse. I know three people that think the world is flat. And they're not kids. They're grown adults. Uh -huh. and they're All right, we're going to get letters, Chuck. We're going to get letters. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if, if they have a right, <laughs> the world is flat. Whereas I'm thinking, you know, when I'm in Hawaii at the ashram, we're right at the edge of, of, of the ocean in a way. And from the second floor, I can see the curvature of the ocean. I can see it curving, you know, from the ashram. And I, from a plane that gets so high, you can't see the earth. But basically, you can see that it's a curvature. I mean, I can see. So those that argue that it's flat, I wouldn't say they're eggheads, but <laughs> I probably would in a nice way because I like to get along with everybody. But there are a lot of people who listen to Randy and Gray talk and they think it's all beyond them. You know, I have friends who would not go that far. You know, and I always say, do you want to play again? Do you want to talk again? Now, I've had friends that have had strokes that never talked before they died, depending upon the kind of stroke you have. But I had a serious one, I think. I'm so glad that I didn't, you know, I was able to, but I had a lot of therapy, a lot of love. You know, I had a lot, and also, too, I'm very nosy. I'm going to ask you, what do you think? And you, what do you think? And you, what do you think? And you, what do you think? Mm -hmm. You know, like, I've been a mess. I've been through prostate cancer. Sure. And before I made the decision to do what I had to do except an operation, I don't want no operation. I want to keep everything I came here with. But the whole thing is I had several options on how to take care of the problem. But I got my advice from just listening and being nosy about what happened to you, what happened to you, and what, what do you think, what happened to you, and what happened to you. And a lot, especially musicians, we can be eggheads. I use that because, you know, it just refers to someone that's not thinking. Mm. You know, I'm like, I'm not perfect. I've been through being an a, a egghead to a certain point. But it don't take me long to figure out if I don't have arthritis, what is wrong? Why am I feeling this? And by talking to somebody, it's the way you're sleeping, bro. You know? And and I was uh and I was and I wasn't a young man when we found this out. You know, I was in my sixties. That's it's, crazy. It's great hearing uh, Greg re re uh, reiterate finger fitness. <clears throat> You know, y'all were talking about, I'm sorry, jump in there real quick, Rick. Y'all were talking about acupuncture. One of the worst things I've done, <clears throat> you know, I'm still in school, you know, that right? I'm a lifelong learner. One of the biggest mistakes I've ever made in, in recent history is sitting in my bed, working on my laptop. Because after, and I, you know, I thought it was just stress, 
because I was getting this really bad pain in my, my neck, right up, right over here. Right. And I mean, and it was bad. And I, and I still have to play a couple of times a week. It's just like, Oh my God, this hurts. But when I'm playing, it doesn't hurt. But as soon as I stop, I'm like, you know, I can barely sit in the car. So I, out of desperation, I bought this thing. It's a, it's an it's an acupuncture pen. Okay. Have y'all ever seen this thing? I've um, seen everything. <laughs> I think I've seen variations of that. But yeah, yeah, there's different kinds, but a, they call it an acupuncture massaging pen. But anyway, it goes from like you know one to nine. I I can't get past one. But I I mean I I put it on that spot for about two minutes, and the pain was gone. Uh -huh. I hadn't come back. Hasn't come back. Okay. No, I now I sit at my desk and I make sure I don't sit in the bed and, and write. But I use this. I paid I don't know thirty bucks for it. But it felt. This is the crazy thing. When I put it on my back, it did feel like a needle going straight into my, into that pain, into that spot where it hurt. Now that's what acupuncture does. I mean, it felt just like it, dude. Like a needle. Freak me out. The needle is a, it's a way, way, way you press. Yeah, but it worked. I mean, I, I, I couldn't go any higher than one, but. Greg, you want to say something on you trying to get out? Yeah. yeah. You know, this is the first time I've said this publicly. Back in 2017, I woke up one day and my thumb felt a little bit sore. <clears throat> And I thought maybe I slept on it wrong. Maybe I was doing a Chuck Rainey. No. <laughs> I did think maybe I slept on it wrong, but it stayed, it was a couple of weeks. It bothered me. And my friend who's a certified hand therapist, she says, you've got this, I can't even say it, Rainey. Maybe it's like the Corkian's tendonitis of the thumb. Decurvains. You know, it, de what is it? It's called decurvains. Yeah, and e -E -R -V -A -I -N -S. yes, and it, so, yes. And if you're like trying to like pour your coffee, it's like ow. Or turn the doorknob, that kind of thing. She told me if you take your thumb and grab it like this and go like that, like I'm doing pretty fast now. Mm -hmm. I, and I did it. I was like ow. She goes, "You got that." That's correct. For me. This is, you know, as a musician, your hands are everything. But especially being the finger fitness guy, I was like, oh, my gosh. <clears throat> so anyway, I saw the best therapist in, or the best hand surgeon in Cincinnati. And he also diagnosed it. <clears throat> and my thumb by that time was going. <clears throat> it had a, a click to it almost. Uh -huh. And he said, all right, we need to give you um, an injection of what is that called? Corticosteroid, cortisone, Cort yeah, epidural, it, right. cortisone shot. Yep. He gave that to me, and it, it felt maybe 30, 40% better. I'm like, okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. A month later, I saw him. It's about the same. He goes, all right, let's hold off. A month later, it's getting worse. Uh -huh. My mom's a psychotherapist. She knew I was worried. And she said, why don't you see an acupuncture guy? And I was like, I really was concerned because I think I'm headed towards surgery. And honestly, my hands are what I do. <clears throat> and by the way, I found out I had a new iPhone and it had a double cover over it. And I was doing lots of editing for like iMovies. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, no. So I took my phone back for some reason. I found out for two, two months, <laughs> That's what caused it. I mean, I feel that my hands, having really good hands, you know, should prevent problems. And here I am having this problem. <clears throat> anyway, so I saw the acupuncture guy immediately, like Chuck said, and I only put like a couple needles here, here, maybe, maybe 10, but you know, right around 20, 30% better. And I did it a couple more times, you know, and it was getting much better. I also, a guitar friend of mine, he says, you know, this is where it is, but it starts back here. 
Randy probably knows this better. You know, I did these kind of deep tissue massages that I also started doing. Um, and I took three things. Turmeric, how do you say that? Turmeric? <laughs> yes, magnesium and B6. I was told those three things can really help out. So with all of this, here's the last thing real quick. I was left with the calcium deposit, a bump. I could see right there. And I was like, ah, so apple cider vinegar. I <laughs> cider vinegar will take away a calcium deposit. And I thought, well, how's it know to go there? So I'm thinking if I, I slept with a heating pad on it, it's like, you know, putting cream in hot coffee, it'll go away there and it dissolved it. And now, as you can see, my hands are basically better than they have ever been and I'm 61 years old. First time I said that too, but you know, people are just guided by typical doctors and medicine, which is great to a certain extent, but they don't ask, well, what if I do this or that? How many people get carpal tunnel syndrome and just say, okay, cut, cut. So I'm telling you, I just feel like I do have a mission to tell people out there. It's the first time I've said that publicly. So there it is. Wow. Yeah. I, I was really worried that it was kind of like looking like this. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody uh, needs everything we're saying. It's a very, very good um, our conversation. I'm, I, en I enjoyed it very, very much. Because a lot of people are just egghead-ish. About a lot of things, you know, like you're right, Chuck. I've had some issues, and I've had to think about it. You know, people just don't stop and think what makes sense. The AMA is basically a good organization. However, at the same time, they compete with common sense. Sometimes, I've got two friends that had strokes and they died because they were overmedicated. <clears throat> I, my doctor, when I got out of the hospital and, and got a I got a uh, a doctor. I lied to him for about two years about medication I was taking uh, because he's, I would go see him. I think when I got out, I would see him every other month for a year. And I saw him every quarter for a year. And uh, now I see him half a year. I mean, every six months. But at the very, very beginning, my body did not want certain things. I was taking 18 pills when I got out of rehab. And of course, the doctor knows what you're taking. Then I slowly, I was just forgetting to take certain things, or I didn't want to take them. And so finally, he caught me one on one visit and said, I said, no, I don't take that stuff anymore. He says, well, you should tell me. He said, you got to tell me what you're not doing. So yeah. if it happens to me, the person behind me, I know what you're not doing as we look at your blood tests and look at your, you know, what's going on. Yeah. But I had a good friend. And somebody, when he was talking to me, I said, man, I think you're taking too much stuff. You know, because I just stopped taking it. Uh, if I, I take something and it, I, don't, I don't feel, now this is just, I don't feel. Now, of course, it's not good. A lot of people have to follow their doctor's instructions. A lot of people, the AMA, they will over-medicate you. They sell their product. Whereas what we're talking about, a lot of things can make sense. If you just... Yeah. Think about it. And doing doing something more than you should is just as bad as not doing enough of something that you should. So we can over eat, we can do over everything. <clears throat> uh, but common sense, also listening to people, whether you like them or not, you know, it could be an answer. Um, a lot, of course, uh, here in the last couple hundred years, people died, would die, they died at early ages. But a little while back, people were living down there forever. Like I'm going to live forever. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, but the whole thing is, like, I think I say that because I'm nosy about health. I'm aware of my body, that's for sure. And I've learned the hard way of what not to do. Over-exercise a hand. Like you can practice too much. You can play too long. You can over-practice. Um, there comes a time where if you pay attention to your body, it's time to stop. You stop and maybe go back, but not a continual thing. Nope. Awareness. Awareness is key. Uh, uh, that, that's the most important thing yeah, that I do. 
is once I get somebody better, I make them aware of what is happening and, uh, and that uh, enables them to keep out of trouble in the future. Hey, you were bending your wrist too much. Don't bend it so much now. And when you feel yourself doing that, back off a little bit. Okay. And they're playing it. Hurt. Oh yeah, that's right. I got to not bend as much. Hey, it doesn't hurt now. Okay. Um, and I, I'd like to just put one, one more thing out there as far as, as, as your uh, recovery, Chuck. Um, we're talking about alternative methods and, and doing things differently and, and that's all well and good. Uh, but as you pointed out, you need to let your doctor know what you are or aren't taking uh, in addition to what they may have told you. Sometimes they don't know what the specialist that they sent you to told you to take in addition to what they told you to take. And these things can contradict each other. Also, Chuck, you, uh, in a situation where someone had a stroke and they need to recover or a post-surgical issue that they need to recover from, um, a lot of times musicians especially, but people in general don't have the insurance or the resources to go through the rehab as they're supposed to. And they either don't do it or they don't do it to its fullest. And this is where you really run into trouble. And a lot of times it's just, hey, the insurance will pay for 12 visits, but you need X amount and they charge 200 bucks a visit or whatever it may be. And there's problems with that. Um, for anybody listening that may find themselves in that situation, it used to be easy. In the old days, a musician, their girlfriend would be a nurse, and that's how they got their insurance taken care of, right? <laughs> I mean, that was what we saw forever, probably still to this day, you know? But um, a, a resource for musicians is Music Cares. If you've got releases out that have been, I, I don't know how many it is, but if you've got a release out that was released commercially on the old definition of what a record label was, and you are a legitimate uh, full-time musician, you can get assistance from Music Cares to help to find specialists to help you or to reduce their bills, or they'll find people who will help you. For example, if somebody called me up and said, hey man, I really need this, but I can't afford to pay you or I can't afford to pay you right now, or I can't afford to pay you as much. There's like-minded people. Like I would see you in a second. Uh, now don't everybody listen to this. Don't start calling me asking me for freebies because I'm going to check on you. But what I'm saying is I would do that. And there's people in every specialty, every branch of medicine, whether you're talking about a massage or an acupuncture or a neurosurgery that also would be like minded if you can find them and music cares can help you do that. So I'm just saying that that rehab that you went through was very specific and very necessary to get and also, you where you are. And also music cares did jump in. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay. Uh, which they do it for any and everybody, whether you belong to the union or not. Yeah. Well, I've been a union member ever since I started. Right. Uh, so I belong to some union. And uh, of course, being fortunate on being on a lot of projects, that does help the fact. But I know people that were not on recording projects and music cares pay their rent for a couple of months or something okay. like that. Yeah. So thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. Well, I don't really know that. Yeah, and thanks I, to Music Airs for, for providing that. It's a big deal. Oh, yeah. I, I would also quickly like to say, because I didn't say this earlier, I kind of wanted to show everybody a, a variety of exercises, tools, and some of the techniques I've developed with finger fitness. But I would usually always start off with check with your doctor or a health professional before starting any exercise. Uh, and don't overdo it. Always listen to your body. Everybody, everybody is different. Don't ever stress or strain. Slowly get into something. And there's a lot of things that some people don't like to do this or that. So find what works for you. And usually if you make it kind of a little bit fun, convenient and easy, then you'll do it a few minutes every day. If it's in the car or next to the couch, whatever. So uh, find what works best for you and don't ever stress or strain too much. Right, so, so, so the old adage, uh, "No pain, no gain," is not necessarily true. Well, you got you got to be careful, really. I think. <laughs> and, and, 
especially when you get older. Yeah. Right. Older people have a tendency to think that they can go back to where they were 30. But I'm here so, to tell you that ain't true. So, Chuck, when did you have your stroke? It was like seven or eight years ago? Uh, I had it in 2011. When did you feel like you would, was that probably when you reached your top ability? Like sometimes I think about when does a musician's fingers, you know, reach their top ability? Like a football player is maybe 25 or 30, but it, like, you know, those top players, 60, 65, 70. Well, uh, the answer to that question, I would say for musicians, it, uh, it lasts until you die. Uh, for some reason, until most musicians die on the bandstand, you know, like it, uh, I think you, originally you asked me, um, it took, it happened in 2011. And what else did you ask me? When do most musicians or, you know, reach their peak of physical playing ability? Unless they have a um, arthritis real bad, then they can't play because sometimes you can't recover from right. some But most musicians die or something other than a physical uh, a thing happening, you know, drugs or um, um, accident, murder. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> but basically, <laughs> um, I was because I know, I don't know if Sonny Rollins is still alive, but he was still playing when he was 96. He just, oof, wow. Uh, um, and I know a few other people too that were playing well close to 100. And they just died because they were old and not physically healthy. Um, of course, when you get to be that kind of age, you're physically healthy. And living past 96 and 97 is a, a true blessing. Yeah. You know, but usually, uh, to answer your question, if you're a musician and you're playing and you don't have arthritis or have some kind of natural disaster with your hands, it lasts forever if you're playing an instrument. Yeah, yeah. We'll see Chick Corea any night. <laughs> <laughs> He's no kid anymore. And man, wow. It's amazing. Get... It's amazing when you listen to, I don't know how Chick, how old he is, but um, He's the kind of person that will die from something other than having any kind of problem with his hands. Yeah. The same with my way with um, uh, Kenny G. You know, but you can look at Kenny G on how he's able to do what he does. He's very thin, obviously very healthy. Yeah. That he can control his breath and play like that. Mm -hmm. um, look at Herbie jumping around the stage. Huh? Is it look at Herbie jumping around on the stage? Herbie will play three hour shows and then he'll get up at the end with the guitar. <laughs> and he's got his backup band. All these seasoned guys are half his age and they're, they're just trying to keep up with him and he's busting. And, and Herbie is close to my age if he's not my age. Yeah. Wow. So Chuck, right now, your hands, you still said you have some arthritis, but overall not doing they, pretty well. They don't bother me when I play. And yeah, very, they very seldom, very seldom, or you know, uh, otherwise. But I know that it's there because I've seen it. They've seen it across here, yeah, across here. Um, and it does bother me sometimes. The weather that I live in used to, I used to think it bothered me, but here in Texas, it's kind of consistent. The summertime is hot, and in the fall, it's not as hot. In the winter, it may snow, you know, so like you get used to that after so many years, but it doesn't bother me. I have no problem. Now I have not played since the pandemic. I have not played my bass. And um, um, when I was playing it before the uh, pandemic broke out real, real big, I was playing, I had issues, but not automatically doing things that I would normally do. I had to think about it. But I had some issues in that I played in bands locally, you know, around here. And then we'll go to LA or New York and play. But between me and you and the gatepost, I knew I had issues because it wasn't the same. But I was able to still, for it not to be noticed, except for maybe another musician. Mm -hmm. 
feeling any music or stuff like that, but basically no, no problem at all. Wow. I'm not affecting the music negatively. You know, once I started playing, I was able to play full. Happened at uh, the end of 2011. 2004, I was back in full force. Still knowing personally where the issue was. Mm. And not showing to the public, you know. Especially my voice. Uh, I still don't have my voice back. Uh, I have issues there. Um, I don't think it shows, but if it does, I know that it's there. You know, things don't come out as quickly as it used to, you know, as it used to come out. Uh, but I did get it back. You know, I got two friends that never got it back before they died. And I'm still alive. And so I've been, I am mindful about my health. There's certain things that I don't eat anymore. I don't eat near the way I used to eat. I feel good about that. Um, Do you take any vitamins or supplements? Um, I every now and then, Greg, I might take some supplements, but I'm now just taking two pills, and I have a certain diet that kind of helps me get all the iron and stuff that I do need. You know, like basically, I'm I fashion myself as a fruitarian, a lot of nuts. Uh, especially walnuts. Okay. Uh, and it kind of helps put all the iodine, all the stuff that's in my body, you know. Wow. Um, and try and eat as little meat as possible. The only place that I will eat meat, not every day, but eat it is in Japan. <laughs> the meat is healthy, it's good, and it melts in your mouth. Now imagine some of these high dollar restaurants that in this country might have the same kind of thing, but I just basically um, uh, stay away from beef. Yeah. You know, um, I like cows. <laughs> A cow never did anything to me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they don't run when you're after them. <laughs> I, my, my, aunt, my aunt Helen, who died at 103, when we asked her at one of her late birthdays, how she managed to stay alive. She said, if it bleeds, runs, and screams, I don't eat it. <laughs> <laughs> so like, they, uh, and she came up in the country. Hey, that's I, some old I, I, I think I remember her saying that, but it makes sense to me. If it's gonna run from you, you, know, you gotta chase it. Now, of course, back in time, we had to run for our meat and stuff like that, you know. <laughs> and if it bleeds, if it's bleeding, she didn't want to see, you know, she didn't do that. Uh, if it runs, if it bleeds, and if it screams. So vegetarian don't scream, it don't bleed, it don't run. You know, so I've been more of a vegetarian or fruitarian for the last, since I had the stroke, although I have eaten meat, but I'm not a meat dog. Right now, it's just my body doesn't want it. Awareness, you're listening to your body. Yeah. Yeah. My body's telling me, if you do this one more time, I'm going to quit. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, man. My body loves meat. <laughs> uh, that one. I love fruit. I love fruit. Like, 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 like was said, everybody's body is different. Yeah. Yeah. So. I mean, they, you know, Randy, you said awareness. If I, I, go, I go back to, you know, that moment when I was 17 years old playing the horn, had I not been a trumpet player, I guess, at that moment, just as soon as I felt something weird, I called my mother, you know, from the school. Something's wrong, all right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, Chuck, you know this, uh, of course, everyone, you know, but when you have a stroke, every second counts. Yep. So I don't, you, you know, being really uh, self-aware is a big deal. I remember uh, I was playing when I was playing Cowboys, right when I came back from England. And I, I mean, I was working constantly up there. And uh, one night before the gig, I just felt weird, like something's not right. Like my hand was feeling numb or something. So I went straight to the emergency room. Didn't even go to the gig yet. Went straight to the emergency room. And I mean, I barely said the words. I, I feel a little numb in my hand. The lady 
I didn't get to finish. He didn't check me in or nothing. They just put me in a wheelchair and took me straight in the back. Um, thank God, you know, thank God it was nothing. It was just obviously just working too much, mm. you know, and uh, the doctor said, you shouldn't go to work tonight. Just, you should probably take a couple of days off and just relax, man. You're stressed. You're working too hard. That's like, I can't take the night off. I don't have a sub. And the doctor said, graveyards are full of indispensable people. <laughs> it's like, dang, dude. He's like, you think they what, you think they're gonna close just because you can't make the gig? Well, yeah. Ooh, you got a gig. Oh, well then wait till tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. You know, he, he's like, you know, you think you're that important that you can't be replaced. Well, you right. know, you're gonna work yourself to death is basically what he was saying. Right. That's, that's, that's being aware of your body. Yeah. yeah. My stroke was caused by high blood pressure. I knew I had high blood pressure. They see the high blood pressure is a silent disease. And I knew I had, I've been told 10 years old, earlier, or 15 years ago that I had high blood pressure, but I always felt good. I never had a problem. Just going to, I, I had a client that I was producing and her mate, was a, a doctor. And she said, well, I've, I've never been to a doctor. I went to the doctor and said, I was getting ready to go to Japan. And she said, your blood pressure is too high for you to be going anywhere. I said, well, they already paid me. I got to go because I'm not giving back no money. <laughs> Plus, I feel good. I don't feel bothered. She gave me a, a, a pill from her office, a blood pressure pill. She said, take this pill and go fill the prescription. And, you know, and take it with you when you go to Japan. I took the pill, it made me feel terrible. I never filled the, the uh, I never filled the prescription. Went to Japan, and she said, when you come back from Japan, come back and see me. I went back to her, and my blood pressure was normal. She said, just remember what you ate when you were in Japan. Mm. Remember what you ate, and, and make that a constant thing. So if the pill that I gave you made you feel bad, all you had to do was call me up and say, I feel terrible, and I would have given you another one. Because they have three or four different high blood pressure pills. You know, I ignored it. Never felt bad at all. As a matter of fact, the day that I went to uh, the emergency room, my blood pressure was 250 over 200. And I did not feel any, I didn't feel any pain. I felt good, I thought. I thought I was being funny by slurring. I think when we had dinner and I was just trying to be funny and my daughter said, there's something wrong with you. And I got up to pee and on my way to the bathroom, I bumped into everything that was not in my way. So when I came out of the bathroom, I was I went to lay down and my wife and my daughter would not let me lay and they were a pain in the butt. So the uh, main hospital in this area it's five minutes away. So I just went kind of pissed off because they were just bothering me and I was feeling okay as if I wasn't. And when I got there, 250 over 200, Woo. the doctor came to me and said I was having a stroke. I said, but I feel great. And he said, when you wake up, you won't. And when I woke up, I couldn't talk and I had no feeling on the left side of my body. If I had gone to sleep, I would have been dead. Now, if I paid attention to the, do the doctor, 15 years earlier or 10 years earlier, I would not have had that stroke because there's ways of checking you know, your, your high blood pressure. There's ways of doing it with natural foods and then the AMA has a way of dealing with it. Either way, I wouldn't have had the stroke. So that's being aware. That's just being aware. They got uh, these things now, Chuck, you know, the Fitbits and things like, you know, the wearable devices now. Yeah. Kind of give you a heads up about. Well, I'm very, I'm very, very lucky. I know what high blood, I know what high blood pressure feels like. Yeah. And I, of course, I have my machine here, but I, I've had no issues uh, with high blood pressure in the last two or three years. As a matter of fact, I haven't had issues. Every now and then, I've had a uh, high. You know, I'm a, I'm a tall guy. You know, and like blood pressure can be 145 over 80 or something like that. But normally right now it's 137 over 80, which is where it should be for a guy my size, you know. Um, 
every now and then they get higher, depending upon what I ate. Uh, that's usually what it is, what I did eat. I drank a lot of coffee. I think coffee has a tendency to make your blood pressure a little bit higher. Um, yes. But other than that, I'm doing very, very well, guys. And I think, like Randy just said, you got to be aware. You got to think about these things. And don't believe everything you hear, even your doctor. Um, they say things like a judge does when they're sentencing someone. When they're sentencing someone. They just look at what this is. They look at a book and say, okay, you get 30 years. Or a doctor will say, okay, take this or take that. And they we can we can be guinea pigs and not know it about what prescriptions work and what don't work. But our body will just let us know. You go to take a pill, and for some reason, you just don't take it. Or you forget to take it. To me, that's your body saying that maybe you don't need it necessarily. Now, of course. That can work very well ways because a lot of people just forget stuff, you know. Right. But if you've had a stroke and you have high blood pressure, you don't forget to take that pill, especially if the consequences can be death. <laughs> a lot of people just don't pay attention to everything. And of course, you want to believe everything that you're told, but then you have to not believe it until it makes sense to you because our bodies are all different. Heavy. All right. Well, we, we, we're we going right about an hour and a half here. <laughs> uh, we should probably wrap it up. What were you going to say, Greg? I think a lot of smart guys from Ohio. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, hey, Randy, do you have a website? Uh, sure do. Website is www.drkertz.com. Uh, you can find out about me there. I've got some musical projects. My book, uh, The Basis Guide to Injury Management, Prevention, and Better Health, featuring uh, Mr. Chuck Rainey, who graciously contributed to that book, is uh, available there as an ebook, also on Amazon. And I just finished part two, uh, which has uh, uh, more tips, more prevention. Uh, more conditions, deeper veins that Greg mentioned earlier is also in there. How to identify that, how to treat it uh, successfully. Uh, did some interviews with John Petitucci and Stu Ham and a couple of other uh, fine, Chris Jeezy and some other fine bassists contributed to that. Uh, I also have a signature strap I designed with John Petitucci coming out uh, by Groove Gear, uh, be out before the end of the year. And a sack strap I did with Bob Franceschini, a uh, signature strap also uh, with Groove Gear will be coming out by the end of the year. So we're keeping busy. I know. Are you on, on, on social media too, or you pretty much stick to websites? Uh, no, I'm on, I'm on Facebook and uh, I'm on, uh, I think I'm on Twitter, although I don't do it too much. Um, I also uh, have a YouTube channel D-R-K-E-R-T-Z TV, where uh, you can find a bunch of videos that I've done. If you're in, in the International Society of Bassists, I've got, I've got years worth of videos for them. And Bass Musician Magazine, just like it sounds, dot com, uh, which is a, uh, uh, an online bass magazine, has dozens of videos of mine uh, on there as I've been doing them for many years. Great. Wow, amazing. Thanks, man. Thanks for coming and hanging out with us, man. Thanks. No, thanks for having me. And I love your book and I love what you guys do. And I, I'm, I'm privileged to know, uh, to know you, John, and to know you, Chuck, uh, over the years. And uh, uh, always, always uh, good to be around you and your spirits and your sensibilities. Thanks, brother. And, and thank you, brother. Really. And Greg, you look like you're ready to do some ballet with them. <laughs> what are you doing over there? All right. Uh do like a quick goodbye commercial. My those who know, know me from my finger ballet when I was on Johnny Carson in 1988. That's when I put together my first book with red and blue gloves. And then later in 1997, the Chinese therapy balls and the complete hand workout, the advanced finger fitness guide, and a DVD for your kids exercise. <laughs> 
kids, all of these finger fitness that I've put together for many, many years. And anyway, it's all at handhealth.com. And my Facebook is uh, Hand and Finger Fitness. So I don't know. I hope that helps. I kind of consider myself to be an edutainer. And uh, hopefully we educate a lot of people. I learned a lot. Chuck certainly uh, was just a great inspiration. Learned a lot. Randy uh, had a lot of us, a lot of smart advice. And uh, John, it's always great to see you. So thank you so much. Good to meet you, Greg. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, man. Hopefully one day we'll, when when this uh, pandemic's over, we can all get together again in person. Let's get, let's get, let's get, more watch, let's get watch as the sunset. You know, that that would be a great place. Say what again? Let's get together where Chuck watches the sunset. <laughs> oh, Japan. Oh, why? Yeah. That's what were you, what were you saying, Chuck? I uh, forget. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh man! Well, guys. Oh, I was saying uh, it was great. It was great to see you again, Greg. It's been a little Thanks. while. And Randy, it's always great to see you. Yeah, my pleasure, Chuck. Thank you, man. I oh, see you every day. Yeah, man. Hey, well, magic Jeff, moment. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. Uh, and, have a good night. Thanks for hanging out with us and uh, we'll see you guys soon. I'll put all the links and at the end of the, uh, the video and, and hopefully Perfect. we'll talk to you guys soon. Thanks, all John. Right. All right, y'all. Have a good one. All right. Be good to each other. Uh, yes, definitely. Peace. And cool. to <laughs> <laughs>